Okay, so then I need to get my PowerPoint up. Okay, so you guys should be able to see this. I should be able to write on here, and we should be able to get going. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk through 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3 today. Um, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not recording. i got to record the meeting. I have to say that I want to record my screen. How do we do that again? Full screen whiteboard. Where's the share the screen? Here it is. Share a window, and that window is going to be this window, and share. And now I can go here. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Technology, don't you love it? Okay, so um, the first part of this is talking about moles and molar mass. And you guys should remember how to get molar mass off of your periodic table, right? Um, you find the elements. If it's a compound like water, you would find your hydrogen. You would find your water. So hydrogen, you would find 1.0 off of the periodic table. You would see that there's two of those in water. Multiply that out to get 2.0. And then your oxygen, there's no subscript here. So you just get the mass off of that, multiply by 1, that's 16.0, add those together, and that's going to give you your molar mass for water. Remember how to do that? A few cobwebs there. You getting it? All right. So then when we're talking about in terms of moles, okay, moles, remember, is a counting unit, kind of like a dozen, or like a ream of paper has 500 sheets, a ream is 500. So it's, it's a counting unit. Typically, most of my calculations that I do in here, I won't have this two on here. You can put it on there if you want to. They don't care as far as AP is concerned. Your calculations, if you do 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, they're going to accept them just as well as if you had that two on there. But on your blue periodic table on the formula sheet on the back, it has the 6.022 is on there for you. Um, that is the exact formula sheet that you'll be able to use. Did you get one of those yesterday? Oh. Um, that's the exact formula sheet that you'll be able to use on the AP exam. So I, I use that throughout the year so you can get familiar with those formulas and you know where they're at on there. Because when you get into that exam, you don't want to have to be searching for formulas all the time. Okay. I also copy that and that periodic table for every test that you take in here. And I put it in booklet form like your note packet is right now so that you can get used to flipping back and forth. Because during the exam, you're going to have to flip to the front. They won't let you rip the thing out. So one of the criticisms or one of the suggestions, I guess I should say, after my first year of teaching AP was that I get you ready with this packet kind of format where you're flipping back and forth to that periodic table. And, and so I'm getting you used to that. So that was one of the things that they had suggested coming out of that the first year that I taught it. All right. So we use these moles um, because atoms are so tiny to work with. We calculate the mass for one mole of a substance by using the atomic average mass for the periodic on the periodic table. Okay, to calculate molar mass, you're going to list the atoms, count the atoms, find the mass of each atom, multiply by the number of atoms, by the mass, and then add them all together. Okay, and that's what I showed you back here with water. There's an example of how you would do that. Okay, makes sense? You remember how to do that? Okay, here's kind of a, a rundown of that. If you have mass and you're going to moles, Remember, if you want to go from mass to moles, you can put that in dimensional analysis where you would have grams here. Your grams and moles would go here. This would be the value off the periodic table. And that's going to equal one mole. Um, if you have it in moles and you want to go to number of particles, you're going to have moles down here, and then you're going to have Avogadro's number here. And I actually, with these fancy TI-84 calculators, I actually have Avogadro's number in here in memory. And so all I have to do is just go alpha A, because that's where I stored it. And then I don't have to type that number in all the time. So 
If you need to know how to store numbers in there and you haven't figured that out, come see me and I can show you how to do that. And then you don't have to type that number in the, all the time. Okay. All right. So this is the first sample problem that we're going to do together. You should have um, this. This should be on the second page, I think, on your in your packet. Yes. Okay. It says, how many moles of lead iodide are there in 25 gram sample? They will end up giving you most of the time your formulas for these things because they expect you to already know how to do that coming in from chemistry. So if you struggled with formulas, for the most part, you don't need to worry about that too much in AP. <clears throat> All right. So we're figuring out moles, we're given grams. So we're starting out with our 25 grams and that's gonna be PBI2, okay? I wanna get rid of grams. Remember, if we wanna get rid of a unit, we always put that unit on the opposite side and whatever we're trying to go to, if we can go directly into it, we're gonna put that unit up here. I always taught you that when you do this, Put your units down first and then go back in and fill in the numbers because your brain just, it syncs up better with your brain. Okay. So we've got one mole here. We've got to figure out the atomic mass for lead to iodide. So I need to find lead on the periodic table. That's 207 point, 207.2. And I've got one lead, and then I've got to have two iodines. So I've got to find my iodine that's 126.9, but I need two of those. 126.9 times two is 253.8. And then I'm going to add those two together, 207.2. So that's 461 for my total mass for lead to iodine. So 461 goes down here, and I'm going to do my division now. So 25 divided by that value, and I ended up with 0, 0.5, 4, 2. Okay. How many sig figs do I have here? Three. three. Yep, three. Okay. Remember, if there's a decimal here, that makes that zero significant, okay? Which means if I'm dividing, I need to have three sig figs in my answer. Zeros at the beginning of a number are never significant. So that makes these three numbers significant. That's my answer. And for AP, if you don't put units down, even if you have the right numeric answer, they will mark it wrong. Okay, not my rule, their rule. Okay, get used to it. I will start zinging you for that as we move through. I'm going to start calling you on it initially, and then I'll start counting it against you later on. Okay, but I'm going to call you on it every time. Got it? Everybody good? Sig figs, I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, on your test, I pick one question at random that would have sig figs as a component, and that's the sig fig question for the test. And you will lose a point on that particular question for the sig fig point. And I just randomly do it. I, I, I take all of the problems. So let's say if there's like five problems that have sig figs in them, I will go one, two, three, four, five. I'll ask a kid in one of my other classes, give me a number between one and five, and that is the sig fig problem for that test. So, I mean, it is completely random, and that's exactly the way the AP is. They pick one problem on the test. That is the one that you will get sig fig points for. So, I try to run it the same way. All right, questions on this problem. Anybody not able to get that or follow what I was doing there? Anybody lost? Talk to me. You look confused. You good? Okay. All right, everybody else good? Okay, cobwebs. You're dusting some cobwebs off, I assume? Yes, sir. Can you explain like, the, the cross graph? This? Yeah. Okay, so this is called dimensional analysis. 
Um, when you are working where you're trying to cancel out units, remember anything divided by itself is one. So if I divide grams by grams, the grams go away. And then that's going to leave me with moles for my units. So, um, and then as you're going across, you multiply everything across here. Then when you get to the end, you hit your divide key. If there's more than one thing down here, you're going to want to put everything in the bottom in parentheses, multiply across the bottom in your parentheses, and then hit your equals key. Okay, so multiply here. Hit your divide key, begin a parentheses, multiply everything in the bottom, end your parentheses, hit your equals key. If you're still struggling with dimensional analysis, let me know. I have videos from like last year from regular chem that you can go back and watch. There's tons of these out on the internet too. It's also oftentimes called the factor label method. So if you've had it with another teacher other than here at Craig, they might have referred to it as factor label method. Okay, so how many atoms of lead are there? Well, when we ended with our problem, we had it in moles and we had 0 0.0542 moles here, okay? Now they wanna know atoms of lead, okay? So here's what I'm going to do with this factor label method. So watch kind of what I'm doing here. These are going to go into moles, right? And then in one mole of lead, I have how many molecules of PBI2? How many molecules in one mole? How many of anything in one mole? Okay, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, all right? But they're not asking me about molecules of this. They're asking me about atoms of lead, right? So in one molecule, of PBI2, I have how many atoms of lead? Nope. In one molecule, I have one of these. In one mole, I have this many molecules. In one molecule, I have this many atoms of lead. Do you remember how to do those? It's kind of like asking, okay, in one parking lot, if I went out to the lot out here, right, and I wanted to know how many tires I had out in that parking lot in senior lot, I would go, okay, in one lot, I have this many cars. And per car, I have how many tires? Four, if you don't include the spare, right? Okay. Alex one time had a flight examiner that was being a jerk and he they asked how many tires were or how many wheels were on the plane and they answered like how many actual tires and then the guy's like well you have the the rolling carts that the flight attendants use and the guy counted those two the guy was being just a complete jerk yeah so you think AP is kind of pedantic. You should see some of those people. All right. Any questions about this? Okay. There's a we do problem. I'm going to skip that right now for time's sake. There is a QR code there that you can click on and watch the video on your own if you have trouble doing that problem. Okay. If we have time at the end of this class, I will go back and do that problem with you. But for right now, I want to try to get through as much of the material as we can, okay? All right, mass spec then, we'll actually be doing um, 
some stuff with different spec stuff this year as we move through. But they, they do do some stuff with mass spec of elements. And remember that we have isotopes. So on the periodic table, the value that's on there is based on the number of isotopes that exist for a particular element. So certain elements, like for carbon, certain atoms of carbon are 12 for their atomic mass. So they have six protons and six neutrons, okay? Certain elements of carbon are carbon-14. So they have six protons and eight neutrons. The majority of what's out there, though, is carbon-12. And we know that because the periodic table has 12.011 for its mass, okay? So that indicates to us, oh, okay, the majority of them out there are probably carbon-12. Good? All right, so how do they come up with that number? Well, they base it on the relative abundance that's out there. So for chromium, for example, if they ran a mass spec of chromium, this is what the data would end up looking like on their graph. And you can see here that 52 is the majority of that material. And if you look at chromium's number on the periodic table, it's, it's number 24, it's 51.9961. So the majority of it, you know, it's right in that section there. So how do they do the actual calculation with this? Well, what they do is they take the mass and they multiply it by the uh, abundance that's out there out of percent form. Yeah. Uh, this might be one that you guys want to highlight because we have four different questions that were based on this last year on AP. Okay. So this, Austin is saying that this one is one that they really, really, really like to kind of highlight on that AP exam. Or at least okay. They liked last year. Yeah, they liked last year. And he gets to see the test. Okay. I didn't get to see the test. So I don't know. You know, I get to see a few of the FRQ questions in the end, but I don't get to see any of the multiple choice. So I have no clue. I have sample questions that I draw from for you guys, but I don't see those questions per se ever. So he'll, he's going to be a good resource for us to, to kind of bounce ideas off of. All right, so how do we do this? We take this mass number and we multiply by this out of percent form. How do we get this out of percent form? Yeah, move it two places or divide by 100. Same thing, right? So this times... 0 0.0435 and this times 0.8379, etc. Once we get all of those done, then we add them together to get the value on the periodic table. Okay. So that mass spec is an analytical instrument there in the chemistry lab. It's going to separate those components by their mass. And then it gives a readout in a graph form like this. Once we have that done, we can use the relative abundance of it, multiply by that mass, and then add them together. That's what this sigma means, that we're going to add them together in the end. Okay? So here we've got an example. This example, we're trying to figure out what the element is. We don't even know what it is yet, but we know what the atomic mass is. So we have one coming in at 39 for its mass. We're going to multiply that by the relative abundance out of percent form. So 0.9326. I'm going to do the same thing here. I have 40. I need to move the decimal point twice over, so that's 0 0.0001. And then I have 41 times 0 0.0673. Okay? Thirty 
36, or sorry, 39 times 0.9326. I've got 30, oh, what did I do there? Oh, I, I missed my decimal. That's what happened. Let's try that again. Insert a decimal. There we go. <laughs> it looks so much better. 33.94. I've got 40 times 0 0.0001, and that's going to be 0 0.004. And then I have 41 times 0 0.0673, and that ends up being 2.76. I'm going to add these together. And I end up with 36.70. Remember, our units on this are grams per mole. Yes, ma'am. I got a good for answer for 39. I got 36.30. All right, yeah, so 39 times. 0.9326. So how about 36.37? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, there you go. First mistake of the year. It took me two days. 37. All right, so let's add those again. Oh, Lord. Second mistake of the year. How's that? Is that looking better? Yeah. Okay. 36 plus 0 0.004 plus, well, like Lippy's never been wrong before. You guys should be used to that by now. All right, let's try this again then, y'all. Let's erase this. I am nothing if not humble because chemistry will humble you faster than just about any other subject you can study. How's that? Does that look better? Or is it still wrong? Uh, well, I grabbed it off of my, I grabbed values and brought them down. So we may end up being just a tad off. But did you get 39.13 if you've rounded it? Okay, then we're good. All right. So now what you're going to do is you're going to go to your periodic table and you're going to try to find an element with that mass. Potassium. Yep. Okay. Number of protons. It's listed by the number of protons. All right, everybody good? That I can't answer confidently. <laughs> All right. So that's how you do those. Not too bad? Okay. Pretty simple algebra. All right. I think this was the we do problem. Is yeah. that right? Okay. So this one, I you this involves a little bit of math. Okay. Or algebra. So you might need to watch that video to figure that one out. If we get time, that's the one I'm coming back to, by the way. If I have time. Out of all the we do's. All right. Pure substances. So pure substances have constant composition. Okay. The option other than pure substances is what? If it's not a pure substance, it's a... Nope. Compounds are pure substances. They're always in the same ratios. Water always has two hydrogens and one oxygen. Mixture. Mixture. Very good. All right. Excellent. You just have to yell it out, Isabella. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Mixture. Okay. So we're dealing with pure substances here. So they're always in the same composition. Okay. Elements. The reason why they're a particular element is because they have a certain number of protons in them, right? Okay. All right. So 
when we talk about percent composition, remember you divide the mass of each element by the total molar mass of the substance. That's how we do percent comp, part over the, there you go. Remember that, as I said that I don't know how many times. Then empirical formulas are the simplest ratios. So when you're talking here about our, uh, like glucose, for example, this would be the molecular, but the empirical would be this guy, because everything can get divided by six. Okay, remember that? Difference between empirical and molecular. Sometimes empirical and molecular are the same, like water. Water, the empirical, and molecular are the exact same formula. And that's okay. It happens sometimes. All right, so how are we going to calculate those? If you're given percentages, you assume that you have a 100-gram sample. Divide everything by the molar mass of each element to get it into moles. Divide by the smallest, smallest mole value. And then if you need to multiply by something, then you can do so in order to get to whole numbers. And then you've got your subscripts. Well, let's run through one of those so we can dust off those cobwebs. Okay? And then we'll come back and do molar mass or molar molecular mass next. All right. So first one, we've got carbon. We've got 40 grams of carbon because we're going to assume that we have a 100 gram sample we're going to divide by the molar mass of carbon off the periodic table to get that guy into moles hydrogen i don't need to divide by its molar mass when it's this way why because it's one so we don't waste our time writing that down we're just going to go with that many moles right that many grams is that many moles makes it a little faster then we've got oxygen. So we've got 53.3, and we're going to divide that by 16 for oxygen. And then that's going to get us into our moles for that guy. Oh, so many cobwebs. So many cobwebs. Did I give you the answers? I didn't give you the answers for these, did I? No? Okay. So this is going to end up being 33 or 3.33. This is what it is. And then this one is 3.33. Okay. So that's my number of moles. This is moles of carbon, moles of hydrogen, moles of oxygen. Next step, I divide by the lowest mole value. So I'm going to divide everything by... 3.33. This equals 1. This equals 2. And this equals 1. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Anybody? I lose anybody. Talk to me if I'm lost, if you're lost. So we can go through it. Okay. So these become our subscripts. This was carbon. This was hydrogen, and this was my oxygen. Happy, happy, happy? Okay. So now to figure out the molecular formula of this, we need one more piece of information. And that one more piece of information is the molecular mass, which they're going to give us right here. Okay. I had, if I bring that formula over from the previous slide, you guys have it right on the same paper, but I'm going to bring it over, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the molecular mass for the thing, and I'm going to divide it by the empirical mass. So I have to add up a carbon. I have to add up two hydrogens, which are one each, and I have to add up an oxygen. And when I do that, that ends up being 30. So if I divide 180 by 30, I get 6. Yep, it's glucose. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to multiply these subscripts by that value. So it ends up being C6H12O6. And that is my molecular formula. Good. Remember how to do those? 
I never got attendance. No problem. Good. I'm glad you don't have cobwebs. All right. So I'm going to stop the recording here.